It's great to see you out uh, today on this nice sunshiny day after the storm we experienced yesterday. Good afternoon, I'm Chris Cooney. It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the beautiful campus of Stonehill College and in particular Martin Institute. Uh, before we get too far into this, I just wanted to introduce some of the new faces on the chamber staff. As many of you know, this past year we had some uh, graduations, let's say. We've had uh, four staff go on to uh, be uh, hired by uh, regional employers, and uh, we're very happy for them. Of course, it created a little bit of a challenge for us to find competent uh, people to replace them. And I know I'm not alone when I talk to many of you uh, trying to fill uh, vacancies right now. It's not the easiest thing for people to have full employment. Uh, but I would like to introduce uh, several of our new chamber staff. Lexi Leonardson, uh, Lexi get away back there. She's our director of programs and events. She comes to us uh, from UMass Dartmouth, where she recently graduated, and also the Venus de Milo, where she uh, did some art marketing and uh, coordination of events and programs there. We also have uh, uh, Marcy Venizia, who is uh, not Marcy, give away. She's in uh, membership. And I know several of you are guests of her today. We hope that you enjoy what you see and you've joined the Chamber of Commerce. Um, Marcy's a resident of Easton and uh, holds an MBA and uh, many, many uh, academic uh, accolades. So thank you and welcome. And we also have Kayla May. Many of you may have talked with Kayla in the office. She has joined us in operations. And she's a Brockton resident and uh, came to us through the uh, Brockton Area Workforce Investment Board, now called Mass Hire. Uh, summer work and learning and internships, so uh, welcome, Kayla. And then we have Emma Stratton. Uh, Emma joined us about a year ago. She's our senior person <laughs> on the staff. And uh, she came to us from Bridgewater State University and uh, heads up all the program, uh, all the... Uh, at this time, I'd like to remind you that uh, we have provided question and answer sheets uh, on each of the tables, along with chamber pencils. Uh, we ask you to utilize those if you have uh, questions. We ask you to ask some general questions. If, you have specific questions. Um, both attorneys have said they'd be around after to uh, talk with you. Uh, but if you have general knowledge questions about what their topic is today, please write those down. Just wave them up in the air, and a chamber ambassador or staff member will grab the questions and convey them to Fran Dillon, who will be our uh, MC. And now it's uh, my pleasure to introduce our MC for today. Please join me in welcoming the former chamber chairman of the board, Fran Dillon. He is now special counsel to the president of Stonehill College. Please welcome. In the first version of my introduction, uh, Chris had said it was Fran Dillon, Vice President for Advancement, and uh, I stepped down from that position um, on December 31st at midnight and uh, became senior counsel to the president. I like special counsel to the president better because senior people think it refers to my age and not my experience. But, uh, but um, so I passed the gavel of the vice presidency to a young man who has worked for me for 25 years and has, we have got to know each other very well over that period of time. And uh, Doug was the associate vice president for advancement. And when I announced that I'd be stepping down, Father John recommended him to the board of trustees and he was unanimously chosen to be the second vice president for advancement in the history of the college. And oftentimes people would say to Doug, boy, you have big shoes to fill. And Doug's response was the same every single time. I know, I've been shining them for 25 years. <laughs> <laughs> and indeed he has. But it's really a pleasure to be here. So first, we always open up by introducing our ambassadors who are the heart and soul of this organization and do a great job for the chamber. And with us today is John King, Series Inc., Richard Hook, Crescent Credit Union, Catherine Light, Mansfield Bank, Brenda Karens, Old Colony Elder Services, Murray Vetstein, Source 4, and Joanne Schneider, Eastern Bank. How about a round of applause? For them? A number of our board members are with us today, including Kathy Smith, uh, Superintendent of Schools in Brockton, Peter Vlacco, Brophy and Phillips, Fren Weiler, Mr. Everything, Joe Casey, Harbor One, Masa Kanbabi of Kanbabi Immigration Law, and Jerry Nadeau of Rockland Trust. How about a round of applause for the board members? 
We have a number of people from area towns with us, including uh, Greg Enos from Avon, Stephanie Danielson from Easton, Robin McSean from Stoughton, Frank Lyman from Whitman, and Rob May from the city of Brockton. Thank you all for being with us. Now you're going to hear from our esteemed director of the Martin Institute in just a minute, and she'll talk about our programming and our mission. But I thought I'd just take a minute to highlight a bit about the history of this building and, and why we're here and why the federal government uh, uh, paid for it. Um, Joe Martin was our congressman for many years. He was from North Attleboro, Massachusetts. In the late 1950s, we were building a library on campus and was to be named for Cardinal Cushing. And at a dinner at Stonehill hosted by Richard Sullivan, our president, Cardinal Cushing and Joe Martin sat together. And after several scotches, <laughs> Cushing asked Martin what he was doing with his congressional papers. Now, Joe Martin was in public life for 50 years. And Joe Martin, who only finished the sixth grade, said, um, I haven't decided what to do with my papers. So Cushing said to him, if you give your papers to Stonehill College, we'll call the library the Cushing Martin Library. And Joe agreed to do that, and thus we built the Cushing Martin Library in the 50s and named it after both of them. Then what happened was, after Joe died in 1968, we, we got his papers. And there was a rumor out there in the next two decades or so that there was money set aside in Washington to build structures to house the papers of speakers of the House. It turned out not to be a true story, but anyways, Father McFadden and myself and a team of people from Stonehill went down to Washington, D.C. in 1986 and asked for money to build a wing on the library to house the papers of Joe Martin. That was the area of Graham Rudmond, and some of you were old enough to remember that was a time when there was, the deficit was getting out of control, at least back then it seemed like it was getting out of control. It was nothing compared to today. And there was a law that said that you couldn't go over a certain deficit. So everything was being cut in Washington, D.C. And we went to see Senator Kennedy, Joe Moakley, who was our congressman at the time, Silvio Conti, who was the only Republican uh, from the congressional delegation at that time, who was on the Appropriations Committee, and that name will sound familiar to a lot of you, Conti Forum at BC is named for Silvio Conti. Tip O'Neill, who was Speaker of the House, uh, and we asked them if they would help us get a bill funded. So they said, how much do you need? And we said, we need $3 million to put the wing in the library. And they said, okay, here's the advice from all of them now. Ask for $6 million and you'll get $3 million. So we wrote a proposal to uh, fund the Joseph Martin Library for $6 million. And we got the $6 million. <laughs> so we decided not to put a wing on the former <coughs> library and to build a freestanding building. And um, in those days, of course, Washington is so different. Uh, you could call for a voice vote. So the votes were never recorded. So the president of the Senate at the time was Bob Dole, and he could have stopped this in a heartbeat. Tip got the House on board, and Bob Dole said to Ted Kennedy, I'll only do this on one condition. We give $6 million to the University of Kansas. So the bill that made it through the Senate on a voice vote gave $6 million to Stonehill College and $6 million to the University of Kansas. And in 1986, Ronald Reagan signed that that law, and we opened this building in 1990. One quick funny story after that. So for all that time, um, from even before Tip O'Neill, John McCormick, it was a Democrat who was Speaker of the House. And a lot of you in the, in the room will remember 1994, the Republican sweep, and Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House. We had an alum named Steve Lynch who worked for Republicans in Washington since he graduated from Stonehill in 1968. And he called me and he said, I've got Newt Gingrich to agree to use Joe Martin's gavel, which is in this building, if you can get it down to us for the opening of the congressional year. So we got permission to take the gavel down to Washington, D.C. I gave it to Steve Lynch, who gave it to Newt Gingrich, and Newt actually used the gavel. But I was getting off the plane who was getting off the plane meet with me was Peter Blute, who was a Republican congressman from out in the Worcester area, he was from Shrewsbury, 
and he was with his wife and his little child who was a baby. And I introduced myself and I said, you know what I have here? I have the gavel that Joe Martin used and Newt Gingrich is going to use it to open the congressional session. So he said, oh, isn't that great? So when I got back to Stonehill, somebody sent me the front page of the Shrewsbury News that said, Congressman Peter Blut helps deliver the gavel for Newt Gingrich. <laughs> <laughs> so talk about taking credit for, <laughs> for things. Anyways, you'll hear much more informative stuff from uh, our director. And uh, it's a pleasure to ask Marcia to come forward to interview our director, who is, says here, Kathleen. I wouldn't know you as Kathleen from any, we call her Katie. <laughs> so Katie Curl Dykeman was appointed director of the Martin Institute of Law and Society in 2017 and has been a professor at Stonehill for 11 years. She primarily teaches classes regarding criminal law in criminal victimization. Katie received her PhD in criminology and justice policy from Northeastern University in 2010. Prior to that, she worked as an assistant district attorney in Suffolk and Worcester counties, where she primarily prosecuted domestic violence cases. Katie was appointed the director of the Martin, uh, Martin Institute in, in 2017, and since that time, she had focused on bringing programs to the campus that focus on social justice issues. Thank you for being in your building today, Katie, to join us. In my senior year, I did an internship for um, attorney Elizabeth Scheibel, who was the, at the time the only woman uh, district attorney in the state. Now we have Rachel Rollins in Suffolk County. And I loved my work there for her, and I was inspired by that work to go to law school to work to specifically become a prosecutor. And so I was able to make that dream come true, and I uh, worked throughout my, I went to Suffolk Law, during the day, but I also worked for DA Conti, who was the DA in Worcester at the time. It's a long time ago now. Um, and I very much enjoyed my time in Worcester. Um, then I moved over to Suffolk County because they got a giant federal grant. I got to meet Janet Reno. She opened a courtroom that just specialized in prosecuting domestic violence cases, and we had a giant uh, federal grant to do that, so I was the supervisor of that court for a while. Um, and, and then uh, I made so very little money all of those years as a prosecutor that I was always teaching on the side, right? From at 25 years old, I was teaching classes at night while working as a prosecutor. Um, and I loved teaching classes. And so the more, uh, as time went on, the more I would teach. And uh, Northeastern University started the first PhD program for criminology and justice policy. And I, um, I was young and I was married. I was 31 at the time when I started that program. Um, and, and it took me a while to uh, finish, but I started here in 2008, I believe. And by 2010, I had completed my uh, PhD. And, and that's that story. Um, the, it's funny, the Martin Institute, when I was in high school, I graduated high school in 1990, and this building was brand new. And I remember seeing it, and it's amazing to be sitting here uh, now, Bob. Yeah, this is a really amazing yeah. institute. Could you tell us a little bit more about what its mission is? And sure. And what your goals are? I would be happy to. Um, so the mission of the institute is to engage students in their communities and to, and to inspire them to be actively engaged. We, I try, and in the past I have a, had a predecessor who you all probably know, Peter Hubertaccio, who did an amazing job, and he's a political science um, scholar and he really did an amazing job bringing uh, to the forefront issues of public policy, and I hope to continue on that work as well in bringing uh, politicians and um, issues of public policy to the center. But also to bridge out a little, I'm not uh, a doctor of political science, I'm a doctor of criminal, uh, criminology and social justice, and so my programs also include 
issues of social justice and how, and that's part of the mission of the college and of the institute, how can our students um, be engaged with public policy but also make a difference. Um, so I try to link the, uh, the speakers to the curriculum. So I try to make sure that the speakers will have some kind of direct benefit to the students in terms of at least one or two classes. Um, and then I try to, you know, bridge also having the uh, speakers have an interest to the broader community because we do get a pretty amazing turnout from uh, citizens from the local towns around the institute. Yeah. I can say, having spoken here myself, having that honor, and also now having an intern from the school and from the Global Crimes Program, I mean, fascinating uh, area and really talented kids. Good. Great. So what types of programs will you be hosting over the next couple of months? So we had a great fall that really was full of um, people trying to become elected to office <laughs> because of the primary and because of the general election. We also had an amazing turnout for Joe Kennedy um, who came. It was wonderful. This uh, semester coming up, we're going to start <coughs> the semester honoring Martin Luther King and we have a Harvard uh, professor coming to talk about his philosophies and how we can use them even today, um, especially today. Um, in our society. And then we have a uh, Fulbright scholar, like uh, Mr. Dillon mentioned, um, or Mr. Cooney mentioned, who <coughs> did some interesting scholarly work up in Maine, interviewing indigenous uh, people who had um, serious issues with their children when they were removed from their homes um, in the aftermath of some of the laws and policies that were around in the 60s and 70s that impacted indigenous families in Maine. Um, we have a couple alumni coming to campus to talk. Uh, local author Chuck Hogan is coming to talk about um, his career. Hopefully the English department is going to be interested in some inspiring writers. And he was a screenwriter for the movie The Town. And he um, lives in a nearby community. And his wife is a Stonehill alum. And we have Jack McDevitt, is a Stonehill alum. He's coming back to campus to talk about hate crime and of why people hate, and he wrote a typology and did extensive research with researcher uh, Jack Levin years ago, and they're going to come talk about their research. We try to do something with art, so we have, in honor of St. Patrick's Day, we have an um, art exhibition honor with a local artist who did a, uh, amaze, some amazing work out of Ireland, and we, have, um, we always end our semester with a concert. Um, mostly for some music majors, but also the community. We had over 250 people last at the end of last semester with a concert. Oh, I have one other one. We have the EP, the student alum from Stonehill who went down and worked at the EPA and worked there. Um, Kevin Manoli and he worked there uh, under Trump and then left. And he's going to talk about the status of environmental law and environmental crime and uh, in his time in DC and stuff. Very yeah. timely topics. Right. <laughs> Hopefully, some of those political ones will bring back a little bit of that uh, bipartisan yeah. uh, camaraderie. So, is now the way you've explained some of these programs, it sounds like they're directed at the community as well, not yes. just for students. Mm -hmm. And so, are there any criteria that you have to do when trying to schedule these, and what audience you're targeting? And yeah. So it's a little tricky balancing it all. Um, so when I try to set out my schedule for the semester, I try to purposely pick classes and professors that will have a link so that I can pull in 30 to 50 students um, no matter what. And then we have a mailing list of two to 400, often senior citizens, but all different uh, people from the area that are on our mailing list and they come. We serve, we often have them at lunchtime because we think our food is a draw. Um, and we've been filling the room pretty regularly, um, and they seem happy with the, the, with the programming so far. And so long as I feel like I'm serving my local community, my Stonehill community, if I can link it to some of the curriculum, if I can stay with the mission, and then I can make, a, make it be um, something that the general public would be interested in as well. Well, hopefully everyone here will try to come to some of these yeah. talks. They sound really amazing. Yeah, thank appreciate you. everything that you guys have done here. Yeah. My pleasure. Thank you all very much for having me. Thanks. <laughs>
and I know there's a lot of interest in this whole issue. So it's my pleasure to welcome to Stonehill College and to the Metro South Chamber of Commerce, Russell Stein and Jay Peabody. A little background on both of these gentlemen. Russell focuses his practice on advising businesses on the intricacies of US federal and state tax regulations and advising nonprofit charities and charitable foundations on federal tax regulations and state charitable regulations, as well as general business matters. Russell provides guidance on joint ventures and partnerships between nonprofit and for profit entities, including advice regarding state regulation and registration requirements involving commercial co venture agreements. Russell is a frequent speaker and writer on tax issues for businesses and nonprofit organizations. He holds a Bachelor of Arts degree from Northwestern University and an MBA from Boston University School of Management and also attended Boston University School of Law. Jay is the chair of the real estate group and represents regional and national owners, developers, and lenders in connection with the purchase, sale, planning, development, and complex financing of office, industrial, retail, large-scale multi-use, and lifestyle residential development energy projects. Additionally, Jay has a special practice representing both landlords and tenants with the management of their lease portfolios. In addition to his practice, Jay enjoys long-distance triathlons and marathon training and racing. Most recently, Jay completed Ironman Louisville in Louisville, Kentucky in 2015 and Philadelphia Marathon in Pennsylvania in 2016. Jay holds a BS from Fairfield University where he graduated cum laude and he also attended Suffolk University School of Law. Jay was named Rising Star in the 2014 and 2016 Massachusetts Super Lawyers. So please welcome Russell and Jay. So everybody, uh, thank you for having us, uh, Stonehill College. Uh, thanks for uh, the warm welcome. It's a beautiful place. I haven't been here since I had friends that went to Stonehill, and I can tell you it's changed an awful lot since I was last year. Um, and also Rockland Trust, who uh, was able to get us um, as a as a uh, presenter for today. Um, I was grateful for the introduction, but this isn't about us. Uh, this is really about you guys. So uh, what we're intending to do today is, is to break this up into to two parts. So because this is um, predominantly a, a, a tax-driven um, incentive or program, I'm going to have Russell start and walk through the Opportunity Zone um, elements of the Tax Act. And then we'll come up together, and I think Fran, through some questions, will um, ask us about some some um, how the act might uh, affect certain development opportunities, both business and real estate. Uh, we've seen, we've presented to a number of chambers and um, some uh, business development groups, some community development groups, and uh, people in the brokerage community, and we've seen a very diverse array of questions. So the only thing I would ask of you guys today is, if you could make the questions a little objective so that it has mass appeal to the audience, we'd appreciate it. I know there might be some subjective issues that you might want to talk to us about, and we're happy to field those. But for the benefit of the, the group at large, if we, can, if we can look at issues that might affect a, a broader base for the questioning, that'd be terrific. And then afterwards, come talk to us so we can, we can work through your own particular issues. So um, I'm going to turn this portion of it over to Russell, who is a heck of a lot smarter than me, um, to walk through the act. And then, as I said, I'll jump up, and, and we can walk through your questions. Okay? So thank you again for having us. Thanks, Dan. So I'm here to talk about the Opportunity Zone Tax Credit, taxes. So very exciting topic for me. I'm sure everyone's been up all night over the last couple of years thinking about their taxes. Uh, but this is a new credit program that really can have a tremendous amount of, or is intended to have a tremendous amount of development for low income communities and the such. What I'm gonna do is give you a general overview of the program and then try to get down to some of the nitty gritty details. Uh, there's a lot of unanswered questions out there and particularly since the IRS is currently closed down, there is no answers. Um, but just getting into the overview of the program, it was enacted as part of the 2017 tax re reform program. Uh, that's important to know because like the other 600 pages in that tax bill, uh, this was not very well thought out. 
Uh, it was a, a lot of it could have been a publicity thing just to get something going for tax reform. So they did not contact people in the tax community, in the real estate community, in the low income housing community to really dig into the details of how this works. Once it got out there, people start reading into it, and that's when all the questions come out. Um, the draft regulations were issued in October. There was supposed to be a hearing. Um, gee, I think the hearing was supposed to be next week or this week. The hearing's been canceled until the IRS and the government opens up again. The way the regulations work is the IRS proposes regulations, but they're not final until after a hearing and after it's publicized in the Federal Register. You can use the regulations as guidance, and you can sort of rely on them at least to abate any penalties if you do something wrong, as long as you're following the regulations. But they are not set in stone. They are anticipated to be changed. Uh, but at least it will give us some ideas of what the IRS is thinking about. There are over 8,700 designated properties designated opportunity zones in the United States. These were uh, nominated by each state governor back in the spring, and for all intents and purposes, they are set in stone. So without congressional action, whatever tracks are now qualified as opportunity zones are going to remain opportunity zones for the next 10 years. There's no mechanism to change the tracks. There's no mechanism to increase the tracks. So it is what it is. Uh, the Secretary has predicted that it could create over $100 billion in private investments in these zones. Uh, you, if you look at the Wall Street Journal or other business magazines, there's articles on a weekly basis about new funds being created. I know one accounting firm has been tracking 54 such funds that range from a million dollars to one of three billion dollars. So there's a lot of talk about getting money to invest in these types of properties in these types of zones. Uh, one thing I caution everyone though is take what you read with a grain of salt. So unless you see it on a legal piece of paper, a legal offering, a lot of this could just be publicity because there's a lot of details that are just not sorted out yet. So someone who goes out saying they're gonna raise $100 million to invest in this, there, there's some issues with how they're actually going to do that and we don't have any answers yet for that. So the general overview of the program is any capital gains that an investor, a taxpayer, a person, a corporation has, if you can invest it in a business and a property in these opportunity zones, and if you invest it in, in within 180 days of recognizing that capital gain, you can have three tax benefits. One, you defer the recognition of that gain until at least December 31st, 2026, or until you sell that investment, whichever is first. You can possibly exclude a percentage of such deferred gain permanently, so it's a permanent tax break. And you can exclude any future appreciation on that gain also permanently. So if you invest in something and it doubles in value and you hold on to it for the appropriate time, that double in value is going to be tax free. And I'm going to give an example of this before I go into the details, because through the example, people really can understand what the program does. Eligible investments have to be in what's called a qualified opportunity fund. Uh, this does not have to be like a big private equity or venture capital fund. You can also think of it as a special, a special holding vehicle, a holding company, a special purpose vehicle. It can just have two investors or one investor and one property, or it could have hundreds of investors and hundreds of properties. But it has to be organized in something that meets the qualifications of a qualified opportunity fund. So you just can't go out and buy a piece of property or buy a business and try to rely on this credit, because if you don't buy it through the special holding company, you're just not eligible for the, the credit. The Massachusetts has 138 tracks in 79 communities. The next two slides, I'll show you the areas that are near us. And the opportunity zones disappear after 10 years. So the designation disappears, but some of the tax benefits can still run to 2047. Uh, someone asked why that date, 2047. Um, the only thing I can think of is that everyone who's involved in the bill is not going to be around in 2047, <laughs> so they don't want to deal with it. There's, there's no other reason. Uh, these are some of the Metro West zones. The ones in green are, are the actual tracks. So you have tracks in Stoughton, Brockton, Rockland, Randolph, Holbrook, and Bridgewater. 
uh, in other maps showing the purple area. So for people who are more familiar with the actual area than I am, those purple areas are the opportunity zones in the area. I'll leave these two slides up during the question and answer period. Uh, and as well, we ha do have the presentation available <coughs> for someone if you want us to send it to you. So there's three primary tax benefits. The first one is if you invest in your capital gain within 180 days of recognizing that gain, you can defer the gain until you sell the investment or until December 31st, 2026. The next is the deferred gain. If you hold on to that investment for five years, 10% of the gain is permanently excluded. If you hold on to it for seven years, 15% of the gain is permanently excluded. Because of the calendar, seven years and the actual drop dead date of December 31st, 2026, investments have to be made in 2019 in order to be eligible for this 15 year exclusion. Any investments made in 2020 would not be held for seven years by the time 2026 comes along. So we are anticipating that in, in 2019, the bulk of the investments are going to go in because that's when the largest tax credit will be. And then the third advantage is the exclusion of appreciation from taxation. You have to hold on to the investment for 10 years. If so, once you sell it, you don't have to sell it in 10 years, but once you do sell it, your basis will actually be stepped up to the fair market value. And in tax terms, what that, what that means is you won't pay any taxes when you sell that investment. Uh, it'll be, it, the example on the next page will make this work. <coughs> So the, here's the example. The investor sells a property, and it can be any property, IBM stock. Let's say she sells IBM stock on April 15th this year for $1.5 million. She bought the stock for $1 million, so the sale created a $500,000 capital gain. She finds a building in an operation, in, in, in opportunity zone that's for sale for $1 million. She goes in with another partner, forms a qualified opportunity fund, and on September 1st, 2019, they will invest that million dollars in the fund. So she's reinvesting her $500,000 capital gain in this fund in 2019. If she holds on to the investment until 2024, so that's five years from now, $50,000 of the deferred gain, which is 10% of the $500,000, is permanently excluded from taxation. So she'll never recognize it in income. She holds on to it till 2026, she hits the seven year mark. So an additional 5% is excluded. So 15% of that $500,000 gain is permanently excluded. The real benefit is gonna be coming in if she holds on for 10 years. However, in 2026, December 31st, if she still is holding on to the property, she is going to be taxed on her deferred gain of 425,000 which is the 500,000 minus the 75,000 that was permanently excluded. So on December 31st, she will recognize $425,000 of capital gain, regardless of whether or not she has sold the investment. So in tax parlance, we call this phantom income. She's going to have an income recognition event in 2026 of $425,000, and she will have to pay taxes on that amount in 2026. Now, number-wise, it's still a tax savings. So if she were to recognize it now and not, and not invest in a qualified opportunity fund, she would have to pay, I think it's $119,000 in taxes. Let me just, yeah. So she would pay $119,000 in taxes on that $500,000 gain now. If she waits and holds on to it till 2026 and beyond, in 2026 she'll, spend, she'll have to pay $101,000 in taxes. So she's had seven years of the use of that $120,000 and then she only has to pay $109,000. So it really is an economic benefit for her to hold on to it. If she holds on to it for at least two more years to get into that 10 year window, then any appreciation after that time is completely tax free. So say she sells it in 2031 for $800,000, if she sells the interest in the fund for $800,000, then she would not pay any taxes on that sale. She held on the property for 10 years, the basis is now stepped up to $800,000, and ultimately she's receiving $375,000 completely federal tax free. So the 
$300,000 is the appreciation, that's tax-free, plus the $75,000 from the initial deferral exclusions. There are a lot of terms involved in this. I'm just going to go over the, the main terms that you might read about. The first that I've been throwing around is Qualified Opportunity Fund, and it's basically a partnership or an LLC or a corporation that's set up specifically for this type of program. Uh, it's not that difficult to set it up, but it has to be done before any of the investments are made. The, the fund has to hold at least 90% of its assets in Qualified Opportunity Zone property. What's Qualified Opportunity Zone property? That's the three items below, either zone business property, zone stock, or zone partnership interests. One thing to note is cash is not on that list. So if, if you're creating a fund and it has cash in it, that is a bad asset. And the funds are tested every six months. Uh, six months from start and at the end of the year. And if at the testing date you do not meet this 90% requirement, then there could be, or well, there will be penalties. How those penalties are working is not yet, is not yet thought out. Um, so all these companies that are saying they are creating these huge billion dollar funds, if they collect that billion dollars, they've basically got to spend it within six months or else they're going to come into some penalties. So the three types of properties, um, it's really zone business property and zone business. And when I say zone business, I mean the stock in the zone business or stock in partnerships of a stone business. Uh, what real estate people focus on is the definition of qualified opportunity zone business property. It's basically any tangible property that's located in the zone, which includes real estate. However, it has to be purchased after December 31st, 2017 in order <coughs> purchased by the fund in order to qualify. And the properties, the initial use of the property has to either commence with the fund or be substantially improved by the fund. So if a fund buys a building, of course, since the building's already there, the initial use cannot commence with the fund. So the alternative is the fund has to substantially improve the building. And the IRS proposed regulations basically say the cost that you have may have put into buying the building, you have to double that cost in improvements. And they give you 30 months to double that cost. Land is excluded from the calculation. So if you buy a building for $500,000, $100,000 allocated to land, $400,000 allocated to the building, you have to put in another $400,000 within 30 months in order for that building to qualify as an Opportunity Zone business property. And then an Opportunity Zone business itself is either a corporation or a partnership where 70% of the tangible property owned or leased by business is actually Qualified Opportunity Zone business. So it's basically a business in a Qualified Opportunity Zone other than some businesses such as golf courses, massage parlors, hot tubs. There's a list of uh, a whole bunch of companies that are not eligible. Package stores are not eligible, but restaurants are eligible. So if you're starting a restaurant in one of these tracks, if you organize it correctly, it can be considered a qualified opportunity zone business. And 50% of the income has to be derived in the zone, or from the zone. Like any investments, there are risks and there are a lot of uncertainties. There's the investment risk. These are not, these are in low income areas. They're in undeveloped areas sometimes, so there's investment risk. There's a tax rate risk that not many people are talking about. What happens if the capital gains tax goes up in the next seven years, especially if it goes up to ordinary income? You would, if you don't invest in this, you're only paying about 23.9%, which is the long-term <coughs> capital gain rate now. If that rate goes up to 40%, you're now paying a higher rate. Now, you still get the deferral and the exclusion might make it uh, economically beneficial to you, but it is something to keep in mind. Regulations are just proposed. Uh, we don't know a lot of answers. Uh, there's no guidance yet on what happens when a fund sells a property. So the exclusion is based on when an investor sells the interest in the fund. But if a fund owns 10 buildings and sells one of the buildings for gain, if it's a partnership under general tax rules, that gain is allocated to the partners. So that gain is not excluded. Uh, people anticipate the IRS to give an answer to that. But as of now, it looks like that gain would not be excluded. 
uh, which is also the same as recycling of money. Uh, opportunities for real estate companies, improve marketabilities for sales in buildings. Your buildings are now more valuable. Uh, your, you might be able to rent it easier because businesses coming in can see the opportunity. If someone's creating a new business, they can potentially create a windfall. Uh, we also see a lot of speculation, a lot of news in Newark, in New York, and in Baltimore where there was a lot of speculations in those areas and people just came and bought up buildings before uh, these funds were even purchased, uh, intending to flip them for some of these larger investors that are going out into the community. For businesses also, there's enhanced market, capital market availability. If you have a small business or any size business that is in the zone and meets these definitions, people may now want to invest in you because they can get a tax break especially if there's a large upside to, you, to your business, uh, which also creates an enhanced exit strategy. You now have all these funds with all these mo this money looking to invest in property or business and opportunity zones. So now there could be more uh, types of entities that may buy you when you want to get out. Uh, there's also a potential windfall for companies like internet startups. If you are looking to start up an internet company, it's kind of a no-brainer to go into an opportunity zone, especially if you're expecting a windfall. You start up the company in an opportunity zone, uh, and then you hold on to it for 10 years, and you flip it. Uh, and it's basically going to be tax-free if you do that. Uh, qualified benefits over 1031 exchanges. We also have people from Rockland Trust. If anyone has any questions, on 1031s and how this interplays with it, please write them down and, and we can get those answered today as well. Um, but potential for income exclusion in addition to income deferral. For our just overview for those not familiar with 1031 exchanges, they're generally used for people to sell a building and buy another building without actually paying taxes on the sale of the building, basically just rolling over their investment uh, until they end up getting out of it completely. Uh, the opportunity zones apply to any capital assets, not just real estates. There's no intermediaries involved. You don't need to reinvest the principal. In fact, with opportunity zones, when you sell your capital asset, they sort of discourage you from reinvesting non-capital gain in the opportunity zones. You can, but it makes it more complicated. Um, However, opportunity, opportunity zones, you're really limited in the areas you can go to. It's just those 8,700 tracts of land in the United States, whereas a 1031 exchange, you can go everywhere. Uh, and this is just our little pitch for Partridge, Snow, and Hans. Uh, opportunity Legal Zone Services, it runs the gamut when you're doing this, these types of projects. It runs the gamut from real estate, startup business, um, lending, all of that aspect, uh, all of which we can provide. Um, so now I think we should open up to question and answers. Um, one last thing, I did, we, I did draft up a little uh, 10 issues you should keep in mind in opportunity zones. Uh, my colleague Jennifer up front uh, has a whole copy of these. If you want to exchange your business card, she would be happy to give you one. Oh. Um, that Russell mentioned, so um, as part of the, um, the fund formation, so we'll talk a little bit about hopefully some of the questions that we'll uh, speak of the fund formation. So because um, the funds will likely be LLPs or LLCs and not, um, and they could be corporations, we're not really anticipating it, uh, the depths will be in the details of those operating documents. So. Um, you know, what we're, we're seeing so far as part of uh, sort of the market at large is on any of the, the fund, the crowdfund type of uh, investment vehicles, the disclosure schedules are unbelievably long because there is so much unknown um, areas of, of risk with the, with the qualified uh, opportunity zone fund and how the regulations, because it's only guidance, is going gonna, is gonna to find itself out that if you're looking at a private placement memorandum or, or risk factors as part of an investment, it's unbelievable. I mean, you, 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 once you, you, know, you sort of think you've seen it all, the, the fund and risk disclosures are unbelievable because there's just so much uncertainty. And, and right now, just not a lot of active investment. There's a lot of money 
being pulled and, and ready for investment, but, but the investments are not happening yet. We're really thinking in third quarter and fourth quarter because of the sunset provision, it's going to have to happen. Um, the other piece of this, which uh, Russell was talking about, is the um, IRS certification. So it's a self-certification, which is, is a little bit unique. So tax and advisory, so if you're doing a fund, it's crucial to get um, a tax advisor or CPA that also is very familiar with the, with the fund and the fund um, rules. So uh, that, I think, needs to be part of your, your business team. And then um, the other piece you were mentioning is the, the, the money that has gone into markets. So Newark, for example, uh, Baltimore were, were markets that were kind of early adopters and, and money was going into those markets. They're seeing lease rates just on the, on the basic lease side at four times um, for tenants going into these um, zone um, assets. So from the, from the landlord tenant side, so I don't know how many operators or owners are here. If you own a building in a, a fund zone, um, we're anticipating that that because of the market opportunity, the, the rates of, of the lease, the rental rates are going to be substantially higher in the, in the very near future, which you know, could be a great boon to the, the, that local economy. Um, last piece, Brian, I'll give it to you, I promise. Um, <laughs> last piece is on the tracks. So everyone always asks, well, where is my, is my property in a track or not? So the IRS has a, um, has a, a, a link and um, it's, it's readily available. I think we even put it on our website or we can make it available to you folks. Um, but the zones are already set. Um, the GIS tracking that is set, uh, that's on the irs.gov site is, is very, very good. And it brings it right down to the street level, uh, whether you're looking at a map or streetscape. So you can find out what properties are in the zone um, by looking at that. So um, if, if anybody's wondering that, it, it is all automated, it's online. Okay. Right. Thank you, Jim. Yep. We have a few questions. And I'll direct it to both of you, and you can choose who will answer. Is there an estimate to the number of projects that Opportunity Zones will generate nationally and also within the state of Massachusetts? Uh, the Treasury Secretary says $100 billion. No estimates other than that that I've seen for Massachusetts. So I, I, I read an article recently. Uh, I don't know. If who here has gone to any of the other, this, there's so much talk in this area right now, and whether it be webinars or, or call-ins by large national brokerages, but we have clients that have brought us in on calls, and I heard about $26 billion in Massachusetts is the, inspect, the expected investment based on the opportunities on tracks as they're identified now. Now, I qualify that because they're not going to change. So I think that number is probably as real as, as it can get. So I've heard $26 billion <coughs> investment which is crazy if you think about it, it has to be done, um, at least a portion of it done in the next um, nine months. The additional would be the improvement, right? Because there's the, there's the concept of the required uh, additional improvement on top of what would be your basis in the property. The, the good thing about that is that the, uh, the zones, because you can exclude uh, your basis in land, the, um, the property values are, are, are pretty negligible. So the investment criteria is going to be satisfied in most cases with minimal um, additional investment. Thank you. Based on your analyses, is there a typical dollar value of these Opportunity Zone projects that will make it worthwhile for investors? It's hard to say because you can't put up you can't put a premium or you don't know what the investment risk is. Um, so ignoring the investment risk, uh, even if the property doesn't appreciate, you're going, if you hold on to it for at least seven years, you're going to save 15% of your taxes. Uh, so if, if you use that as your minimum rate of return, it seems to be uh, a really good investment but there's also the investment risk. Okay. With the tight timelines outlined, how can cities and towns streamline processes for building permits so as to encourage and allow longer investments and renovations to be made within the timeline allowed? <coughs> Any good examples of cities or towns that have been able to streamline this process? Yes, I'll, I'll speak to that. So. Um, 
we have offices in Boston and Providence, then we have an office in New Bedford. And um, I've started having some conversations with um, the economic development folks in New Bedford about this very issue because they're concerned. Um, they've had uh, a number of uh, town hall meetings where uh, business owners and or owners of assets in opportunity zones are encouraged to come and talk to them about, about the program and how they can um, benefit from it. And that question about uh, permitting and timeline is, is something that's coming up regularly. So what we're starting to do, and, and, and I'm telling you this because it's happening in real time, um, we're starting to figure out how we approach both the city council and the mayor to, on an expedited basis, create a, a fast track for um, opportunity zone permitting. Um, because most of the uses that are qualified and that developers want to um, to uh, approach are not by right uses. They're usually uh, based on either some special permit or variance request. So it's going to end up being a, it's going to have to be a, a citywide effort because you're talking about a, a zoning board, a planning board, a city council, and, um, and the planning office all acting together. And in cities and towns, and I'm not sure about Brockton, but I can tell you in other cities and towns, those boards don't always act together. Um, so it's going to have to be a comprehensive effort, but it's going to have to start at the top, the mayor, at the mayoral level, and then uh, find its way through uh, a, a very quick uh, city council approval and uh, expedited process. So it's happening in New Bedford. Um, I've heard that it's starting to um, be discussed in the Worcester area, because Worcester has um, a pretty uh, robust opportunity zone. And I'm not sure about Brockton, I'm not sure who's here from the, the Brockton city level, but um, I know you guys also have a very large opportunity zone, and, and I would hope those conversations are starting. And, and with those conversations, remember, this is just a federal program. You still have all the state tax incentives. So a lot of these communities also have tax increment financing, property tax uh, abatement. Uh, so it's a good idea to try to wrap those conversations up in this as well, to try to get as much tax benefits as you can. If you think about the natural progression from um, site control to entitlements, you know, in most, uh, in most municipalities, it's six to nine months. And <coughs> I'm assuming that site control still needs to achieve with these projects, that's not really attainable unless cities and towns do something about it. So um, it's going to have to happen. Just an aside, you hear a lot of talk these days about why we don't teach penmanship in school anymore. It's because people forget. I can hardly read the writing. That's okay. <laughs> how much of a 10,000 square foot building could be housing and how much would be required to be business? The, there is a requirement for active trade or business. Um, there is no definition of that yet. Most people believe that if that um, low-income housing, if it's all low-income housing, will still qualify as this. So there is no requirement per se. Um, I think if if the, the housing can still be an act of trade or business, even if it's you're selling condos, because the business would be selling those housing. So and if it's rental, it's definitely an act of trade or business. So it's a good question. We don't have any uh, we don't have any guidance at all from the IRS. But it is one of the things it is intended to do is create housing. Great. When I um, I spoke to a few people, and each developer uh, has asked that question, and my recommendation to them is to consider uh, a mixed-use project, which is probably <coughs> what um, the incentives really geared to, uh, because of the areas that, that, that the tracks were the, the designated tracks air, air, tract areas. So. Um, when I say mixed use, uh, upper level housing with an affordable component with the street level um, uh, business of commercial is the right project that's sort of the prototypical project. Um, I am not a true believer that like a sales office would count. I think it needs to have something more than um, pure residential with a commercial component. I think it needs to be something a little bit more brick and mortar. And, and the problem with if you're selling condos or housing units and not leasing them is there's also no, re no regulations yet on what to do when they sell the project. So if you 
create this project, in two years you start selling your condos, under normal tax rules, you're going to have capital gain. Uh, what happens to that capital gain, we don't know. Whereas if you just create housing that's rental, you're not going to have capital gain until you sell the rental property. You're going to have rental income, of course, that's taxable. But the capital gain aspect, we just don't know how that's going to be treated. Okay. Can you name other investment tax incentives that can be stacked with opportunity, opportunity zones? For example, historic tax, angel investors, no markets. Yeah, they, um, they should all still be able to be attached if it's the same area. Um, it will probably get a little challenging with the new market tax credits because if anyone has, has gone through those deals, the structures are really complex. Um, but there is no prohibition in the opportunity zones from taking other types of credits. The way, we, the way we've seen uh, these deals pro forma so far um, is that you know, there is a mixed component of, this is a really a credit enhancement. So we're seeing a mix of both traditional debt, tax credit, um, monetization, and the equity investment. So it's, it's, it's we, we're not of any mindset that those are gonna be disqualified. Uh, in fact, we have a tax credit um, lawyer in our office that recently uh, came on board and she's kind of excited about this because um, it is nationwide. Uh, and she does tax credit work throughout the country. Great. If someone realized a capital gain in November of 2026, invested it in an opportunity zone through a qualified opportunity fund before December 31st, 2026, they would not be eligible for the tax deferment or the 10% and 5% tax benefit. However, they could theoretically take their investment for 10 years and not be taxed on any new capital gains that were realized. Is that a correct statement? Yeah, that's correct. They can hold on to it for 20 years until 2047. So as long as it's eligible capital gain, so as long as you invest the capital gain in the fund before December 31st, 2026, any appreciation in that fund is going to be tax-free. I'm just glad you answered that. <laughs> I'm like, okay, I took one law, uh, tax law class in law school, and it was not pretty. <laughs> uh, talk more about stocks, uh, types of stocks like stock market. How can this be tied to an opportunity zone? Can stocks be transferred to a qualified opportunity fund? No. 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 There's, um, qualified opportunity business can have 5% of its assets. Now, a qualified opportunity business, just to refresh your memory, um, it has to have 70%. Um, I can't read it up somehow. I passed it. But it has to have 70% of its assets. There it is. Substantially, all of its assets, 70%, have to be in qualified property. A qualified opportunity business can have 5% of its assets in what's called in financial assets, including stocks and bonds. So the business can have 5% of its assets in stock, but that same requirement is not for the fund. The fund can have 10% of its assets in anything it wants, um, but including stock, so you can put 10% of your assets in there. But the accounting rules are fairly um, stringent, so you need to do a lot of number crunching to make sure you're not going to mess up that 90%, because as the assuming it's a good stock and you put it in there, the stock's value is going to keep increasing. So it's going to make it a lot harder to hit that 90% mark, especially if you mark to market the stock according to your financial statements. So um, it's not, these programs are not made to put, put publicly traded stock into. Um, I wouldn't be surprised if you see something like the anti-abuse regulations, um, but it's, it's really not for that type of investment. Okay. The last question is actually a two-part question. Will Massachusetts adopt similar program and tax code? And can current owner of property sell it to a closely held qualified opportunity fund for fair market value and get the benefits? The, there are related, I'll take number two. First, uh, there are related party rules. 
which, uh, which, prevent, uh, which prevent the funds from taking property from related parties and being eligible for this. Uh, one thing to keep in mind, related party rules do not apply on the back end. So currently, as we see the regulations, if in 10 years you sell the property, you can sell it to a related party. But to buy the property, there are related rules that make you a little challenging. Um, on the first question with Massachusetts, I have not heard about whether Massachusetts is or is not going to adopt them. Uh, but I, w I was on a call the other day, and one thing to keep in mind is this program is really for the states. It's for the state's benefit, especially for the areas that it's targeting. So politically, it would be a little difficult for states to say, we're not going to, um, we're not going to follow this rule, because the rule is really for the benefit of the communities. You have some states like California, North Carolina, um, a couple of others that are actively going forward and saying, yes, we're going to have a similar program, maybe even a little more beneficial. Um, not only in Massachusetts, anything in the Northeast has, has come out and said that yet. The only thing, uh, so only slight contradiction to that is I have heard that there's a growing <coughs> lobby to have uh, to, to uh, have Massachusetts enact something similar for the very reason that some of the um, well, California in particular. Uh, and generally Massachusetts follows federal law. So um, I haven't looked into that aspect yet, but they may actually have to decouple in order to not follow it. So the general rule may be that when you exclude the gain, because it's not recognized, Massachusetts wouldn't recognize it. But whether they do anything above and beyond that, I don't know. Great. Well, thank you, Jay and Russell, for that informative discussion. We're very grateful for your presence here today. On behalf of the Chamber, I have a token of our appreciation. Thank you very much. first-class state reps who are in the audience with us, Claire Cronin and Jerry Cassidy. You're always welcome to stand with us. Thank you for being here. And now for a brief chamber update. We invite all of you to attend our next Good Morning Metro South, sponsored by OCES, which will take place on Friday, February 22nd at 11.45 a.m. at the Southeastern Technical Institute in Easton. The event will feature the Mayor of Brockton, Bill Carpenter, who will provide a State of the City address, unless we're all furloughed, uh, <laughs> with an emphasis on regional issues of importance. Housing, water supply, sewer services are among the topics to be covered. Tickets and table, tables of 10 are available. Please see Lexi if you'd like to uh, register for that event. Our fourth annual Multicultural Business Forum and Business After Hours, sponsored by Mutual Bank, will be on Thursday, March 7th at the Perfect Place in Brockton. The event will be held from 5 to 7.30 in the evening and features resources, a resources expo, a minority and women-owned business panel, a great networking opportunity. This event is free to attend and you can sign up through the Chamber's website or again see Lexi at the back of the room. Lastly, please save the date for the annual Taste of Metro South. We are happy to announce the Taste of Metro South will be held on Wednesday, April 24th at the Shaw's Center in Brockton. And once again, we've chosen one company to be highlighted with a member profile in our action report. And this month's company is School on Wheels. Congratulations, Barbara Fox. And now we have two door prizes to be awarded, and each door prize is a bottle of wine. <coughs> Winner one from Harbor Health is Julie Richer. Congratulations, Julie. <laughs> and winner two from Gerald T. Riley and Company is Joe Femia, who just had a birthday this week. Happy birthday, Joe. Congratulations. 
And just before I wrap up with our thank yous, uh, a number of you asked me how retirement is going, and I'm not really retired, I'm just working less than full time. I am home a lot more than I used to be. My wife retired a year ago, and I thought it was going smoothly. Uh, and I've learned that um, there is a right way and a wrong way to put dishes in the dishwasher. I, I and I also learned that you wash the dishes before you put the dishes in the dishwasher. I haven't figured out why, but I learned that. But I thought it was going very well. But on my way to this event, there's now a billboard on Route 138 in Rainham, where I live, with my picture on it. And it says, He's looking for a full-time job, and he's available nights and weekends. Sign Linda <laughs> So I guess it's not going quite as well as I thought. But listen, a, a lot of people came together to make this program successful, and I'd like to thank first our ambassadors team, Rich Morgan, Rich Morgan Photography, the Martin Institute here at Stonehill College, Brockton Community Access, the Enterprise, Masha, who, Masha, who also does such a great job with, uh, with the chamber and with interviewing. Katie from Martin Institute, and also Jay and Russell for their uh, informative presentation, and all the chamber staff. Thank you all very much, and go Patriots.